There, there aren't a lot of people that you can count on all the time. There aren't a lot of people that are consistent enough for you to have 100% confidence that they will always come through for you. But I just thank God today that I can always rely and count on him. We thank God today for our youth. Um, we thank God for them and for them helping direct our service and for what they've done for us today. Let's make some noise for them as they get prepared to go back to their class today. <laughs> Praise God. Let's continue encouraging them and continue giving them the pats on the back, the high fives, the attaboys. Keep them going because you never know how much encouragement your words can give to somebody that can stir them up and stir that gift up inside of them that'll take them to the next level. So I just want to praise God for them today and uh, thank God for them as they get ready to go back to their class. Um, let's open our Bibles today for what the word of God has for us. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9, starting with the 57th verse. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 is where we, we will start. And as I was in my prayer time this week, um, God gave me a word for this year that I know is applicable to me and I believe will be very applicable to you if you desire to grow in what God is doing for you this year. And that word he gave me, I'll give to you just after we read this scripture. Come with me. We're in Luke chapter 9, verse 57. If you are able to, let's stand on our feet as we honor the reading of the word of God. Luke chapter 9, verse 57, and we're going to read through verse 62. And this is how it reads. It says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, come follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Today, I want to talk to you for just a few brief minutes from the subject title, Almost Doesn't Count. Before you have your seat, I want you to find somebody and tell them, Almost Doesn't Count. Almost Doesn't Count. Let's pray over the word. Holy Spirit, we just pray today that you would show us that almost isn't enough because almost doesn't count. Amen. Amen. You can have your seats in the presence of God this morning. Almost doesn't count. In order for us to be more like Jesus, it's going to require something from you. While you're given salvation as a free gift, and we're grateful that God gives us salvation, it is important for us to live a lifestyle that reflects the character and the attitude of Jesus, and we only get to that lifestyle by living in something called discipleship. That word that I believe will make us grow and get to the next level in what Christ has for us this year is discipleship. Somebody say discipleship. Discipleship is something that's very important for those who call themselves followers of Christ. In fact, our working definition for discipleship for these next two weeks that I'll be preaching on it is a journey of intentional decisions leading to maturity in your relationship with Jesus. I'm going to read that part again. It's a journey of intentional decisions, meaning things you do on purpose, making those decisions, leading to a maturity in your relationship with Jesus. And when you do that, you become more like him in your attitude, more like him in your focus, and ultimately more like him in your behavior. But it starts by you making an intentional decision to find Jesus in a deeper way. 
And so the only way you can be more like him is if you're spending time with Jesus, if you're spending time in his word, if you're spending time in prayer, if you're spending time with others who are on that same journey. And so in order to move into this attitude of discipleship, it's going to require your intentional decision making. That's why it's so important at the beginning of the year as we're fasting and we're praying and we're seeking out God, that we're intentional about that so that God can have the open doorway to our lives so that he can speak with us and fellowship with us and bring us closer to being like Jesus. And, and while we, we have the opportunity to fellowship with, with God, we have to understand that in our scripture today, they, we had the opportunity to fellowship with God in a spirit form, but they, in this scripture today, had the opportunity to fellowship with Jesus in the flesh. With Jesus, the man who was walking this earth, the people that he was speaking to had the opportunity to be discipled directly by Jesus, and yet, instead of doing that, they didn't make it. They made the decision otherwise. They were almost disciples of Jesus. They were so close to being disciples of Jesus. They were almost there, but as we said already today, almost doesn't count. Almost doesn't count. They were almost people that we would be able to identify and call out as disciples the same way we can say Peter and, and John and, 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 and different disciples, but instead, they are just somebodies. People who did not fulfill their calling and their purpose. In fact, in verse 57, we see as it says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus. Yeah. We don't even know the name of the person who didn't get to become a disciple. We can name Peter, James, and John, and we can name the disciples, but this is just someone. And they did not get their name established because, as we said before, almost doesn't count. In the late 90s, one of the better voices of our decade um, was a woman by the name of Brandy. Anybody familiar with Brandy? And she had a song by the name Almost Doesn't Count. And in that song, she's de detailing the pain that she felt when the experience of a relationship that seemed to be on the verge of something good, that seemed to be on the verge of something that was really going to amount to something. But what she discovered was it just never materialized. And even though it was close, Almost doesn't count. It was almost something special and, 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 and cohesive about the relationship that was taking place that she talks about in the lyrics, but in the end, she realizes that it just wasn't enough because almost doesn't count. In the lyrics, she says this. She says, I can't keep on loving you with one foot outside the door. I, I, I hear a, a funny hesitation of your heart that says it's not really sure. I, I can't keep on trying if you're looking for something more than all I can give to you. She makes it clear that he's got one foot in and one foot out. That, that he's hesitating, that his heart's not really sure if it wants to really commit to, to the relationship. The heart is, you know, one foot in, one foot out, and, and, and it's out looking for something more than what she has to offer. And I just wonder today, how many people would God look at and say, I love you, but you got one foot in and one foot out? I, I love you, but I see a hesitation in your heart when I give you commands that, that got you looking a little funny to me. It, it says there's an opportunity for a great move to happen right here and right now, but you look out looking for more than I, you think I can give you. You out looking for something else. And, and, and I just wonder today if we are living a life that is almost, and in the end, won't count. If you ever want to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to know that almost does not count. Our, our, our scripture gives us detail on these three men that were, that were almost disciples of Jesus, and they had a prime opportunity to join the greatest ministry that's ever taken place on this earth. They had a prime opportunity to, to be a part of something that accomplished something that nobody else has ever done before. They were able, they were going to get the opportunity to walk and talk and be discipled by Jesus, but unfortunately, they turned the decision down. They all made the decision that in the, they initially that they wanted to follow Christ, 
But they all gave excuses as to why they couldn't commit to following after him. They said, what you're doing is incredible. What we see taking place is amazing. This is extraordinary. In fact, the, the first person jumps out, and before anybody even says anything to him, he jumps out and says, Jesus, wherever you go, I'll follow you. He didn't even have to be prompted. Jesus didn't even speak to him. And yet, he jumped out and said that he would make that decision. A lot of times what we see is that when we see people that are successful, when we see people who are doing things that are of note, and, and they look to be of acclaim, we want to be associated with them. We want to be nearby. We want to rub shoulders with, with people that we know are doing something. And we can see how somebody who's popular would get the attention from people all around. But Jesus as Lord is a different story from Jesus as being our Savior. Understand, we get excited about the fact that Jesus is our Savior. We get excited about the fact that our sins are forgiven. We get excited about the fact that we no longer have to sit in shame and we no longer have to be sentenced to the ultimate death that came from sin. But when it comes to Jesus being our Lord and being the one who's directing our activities and the one that we have to follow his command and instruction, then all of a sudden it's one foot in and one foot out. <laughs> I'll take the salvation, I'll take the saving, but you want me to follow your instructions? Ooh, I don't know about all that. <laughs> That's tough to do all that, Jesus. Savior, yes, but, but my Lord, ooh, my master, my, my, the one I got to follow instruction, that, that's a lot to deal with. But in order for us to be followers of Jesus, true followers of Jesus, we can look to these men and avoid those pitfalls by allowing him to be our Lord. There are three things that, that we can't allow to dictate our devotion to Jesus. There are these three things I want to give you today that will help you if you avoid them and don't let them dictate your devotion to Jesus. And that you don't find yourself in the almost category. Find yourself in the uh, just missed the mark category. But instead, you'll be able to exemplify the characteristics of one who is a true follower and true disciple of Jesus. And so the first thing that we need to look at in this scripture and see and that we avoid in our own life is that we don't allow our discomfort to stop us from being true followers of Jesus. Your comfort should not stop you from being a true follower of Jesus. The first man actually, like I said, he calls out to Jesus himself. He says, wherever you go, I will follow. Wherever you find yourself, Jesus, I'm going. You got something big going on right now, and I got to be a part of that. I don't want to miss this opportunity of being a part of that. And he's so enamored with the idea of what Jesus is doing that he volunteers his own service without Jesus even speaking to him. He sees the miracles taking place. He sees the notoriety of Jesus. And he sees the followers. And he wants to get a piece of that. So much to, to the fact that he yells it out in front of everybody with, without even being called on. And what's beautiful about Jesus' ministry is he wasn't worried about discouraging people from following him. He wanted them to count the cost of what it would take in order to be a disciple of Jesus. He says, I don't want you to jump out here ignorant to the fact of what we go through as being servants of my God. He tells him that you might be a little uncomfortable when you're my disciple. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it might not be plush as you think it is to be my disciple. He says, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place even to lay his head. Yeah. Jesus is telling him at the peak of this ministry, with our well-renowned fame and people knowing us and us doing great works, I don't have a permanent address. I, I don't have a place where I, I receive mail at. <laughs> because right now, I'm just going wherever the Spirit leads me to do the work of the Spirit regardless, and I know my Father will provide for me wherever I go. So I don't have the convenience of having an address. I don't have the convenience of knowing exactly where we'll be sleeping tonight. As my follower, you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. As my follower, you have to acknowledge the fact that your father is going 
to provide for you, and you can't be afraid of what you don't see in front of you. The certain assurances that some of us have in our lives and the things that we take for granted at times, if they were removed, we would be in total disarray. But when we serve God, we have to understand that even without those comforts, even without those things that we're so used to, that our Father will still provide for us if we're following after his will for our lives. Yet, he didn't have a, a, a home or residence. He said the foxes have, have homes. The birds have homes. And, and, and even me, who is greater than and created those animals and created their habitats, I don't have a place to lay my head. That doesn't sound comfortable nor desirable. I'll be straight up with you. I, I understand the, 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 the hesitance of this man after hearing that, okay, y'all doing all these works, but y'all ain't, no, ain't got no house. Y'all ain't, ain't even got no hut. What y'all doing out here? But yet and still, Jesus still had loyal followers that always found accommodations wherever they went to. Jesus was still able to travel. He was still able to witness, and he was still able to handle his ministry because even though they didn't have a house, they had the Father who was providing a place for them so people would open their doors for, for followers of Jesus. People would provide meals for followers of Jesus. People would provide their stay for them. And even though there wasn't a permanent residence with their name on it, God was always there providing. The problem is, with some of us believers today, is that we let the slightest discomfort stop us from truly living as a disciple of Jesus. We let the slightest inconvenience stop us from truly following out where Jesus is trying to lead us. Jesus said if we want to be his disciples, then we're responsible for picking up our cross and following him. Picking up our cross and following him. Now, I know a lot of y'all are thinking, okay, that sounds wonderful. You know, we all see people with the crosses on their neck, and we see them iced out, and we think about the beauty of the cross. The cross, you know what that was used for? That was a Roman capital punishment that they used to kill criminals and make them suffer a painful death. They made them suffer and literally suffocate on their own blood on the cross for hours as a punishment. And what Jesus said is, I need you to pick up this torture device and follow me. Pick up this thing that will cause great pain and follow me. Trust that this pain that you're experiencing right now will be temporary because when you're following me, my father will ultimately take us to glory. So pick up what you're dealing with. Pick up this cross. Pick up the hurt. Pick up all the, and follow me. It's easy to be around for the healing. But when he calls you to bless him with your finances, are you ready to leave? It, 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 it's easy to get excited to hear that God is going to bless us. We get hyped then, but when he tells us we need to love our enemies, it's easy to fade away at that point in time. I want, to under, want you to understand that discomfort is beneficial for us in the kingdom because it keeps us relying on Jesus. When we get comfortable in what we got and, and our resources and everything that, we're, that we have the ability to get, it's easy for us to rely on self. It's easy for us to forget about the fact that Jesus brought us as far as he has. And so discomfort at times gives us a little nudge and reminds us, hey, you ain't doing this on your own. This isn't by your own strength that you're where you are right now. It, it, this isn't because of what you've done that you're granted the success that you have. But it's by the grace of God that you've made it thus far. Jesus' disciples had the particular challenge of where they would lay their heads on their journeys. But in the midst of that, they got to follow Jesus and be personal with him, have conversations with him, have relationship with him, and be able to be, have their names recognized thousands of years later because they took up the call of following Jesus despite the discomfort they may have experienced in their lifetime. They got to see the miracles of Jesus firsthand, and we even know their names now so many years later because they didn't let something like discomfort stop them from experiencing Jesus firsthand. I want to encourage you today that, that some of the commands of Jesus may seem like a tall order for you in your life. 
Some of the commands of Jesus will be difficult for you as you begin your journey on discipleship. But I want to encourage you by letting you know that if you keep at it, that if you keep trusting in him, if you keep allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through you and lead and guide your actions, that no matter how difficult it may seem, that no matter how hard it might seem on a daily basis, that he will guide you through whatever you're experiencing. And his presence being there will allow you to move forward in the plans and purposes he has for your life. The next thing that stopped the disciple from dedicating himself to Jesus was urgency. Urgency. Or in this case, a lack of urgency. We can't allow a lack of urgency to stop our discipleship. The first would-be disciple actually called his own number. He saw Jesus walking by and he called out to Jesus and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. But the second man received an incredible privilege because instead of calling his own number in and yelling at Jesus, Jesus sees him and he says, come follow me. He, he points this man out in, in what was inevitably a crowd and he says, follow me. Can you imagine being called out specifically by Jesus and saying, come follow me? The, the, the privilege and the honor of being told, come follow me. When, when Peter was given that instruction, he had had probably one of the single greatest fishing days that he had ever had in his career. His boat was so full of fish when Jesus came on the boat and told him to cast the net out that he had to call his homeboys over there to come help him collect all the fish that was there. There was so much. That was probably the best day he ever had on the job. But when Jesus said, come follow me, guess what he did? He left. He said, this was a great day at work, but following him is greater than anything I can do on that water. Following him is greater than any good day and any amount of finances that I can collect. He did not hesitate. But this man was different. Jesus said, follow me. And he told Jesus, I'll follow you, but first. <laughs> I'll follow you, but. I wonder how many of us today are saying, God, you're calling me, you're beckoning me, you want me to be a part of your family? I'll follow you, but <laughs> let me handle, you know, my family circumstances I got going on right now. I don't want to be looked at as a hypocrite and people look at me like I'm not really a part of your followers. So let me handle this. God, I'll follow you, but <laughs> first and foremost, let me take care of mine. I wonder how many of us find ourselves saying, I'll follow you, but. The context of his excuse could have two different meanings in that culture. He said, let me go and bury my father first. He could have been saying, my father is deathly sick right now, and so let me stick with him until he passes away, and then I'll bury him, and then I'll come follow you. That could have been one of the things that he was saying. Or he could have been saying, my father is already deceased, and we're going to go through this weeks-long ritual of making sure that he's buried and that he's properly mourned and that we're all together and we're going to celebrate his life and then we're going to cry together and we're going to take a few weeks to remember his life. And while neither of those things are wrong, what we're looking at is the fact that he was putting those in front of the ministry of Christ. He was saying, what I got to do important than where you're taking me, Jesus. What I'm dealing with right now is more urgent than spreading your kingdom. What I'm dealing with right now is more important than what you got going on, Jesus. So while I will come because you asked me, let me handle my business first. I want us to get our priorities in line. I want us to get to a place this year in discipleship where we say, of the paramount of our life is following after where Christ is leading us. Not making excuses about what we got to do and what we got to handle and what things are more important, but instead saying, Lord, where you tell me to go, I will follow. Lord, when you make a pathway, I'm walking right through it. I'm not stopping to worry about what happened beforehand. Lord, I'm following into what you got for me. Not later, not in five minutes, not in five hours, not in five days, not in five weeks, but right now when you call me, I will follow you. 
He didn't give Jesus a, a, a no. He didn't say, I ain't following you. He gave him a not yet. A not yet. And our not yet is no better than a no. Not yet isn't giving you any more leeway and making you any better than if you had to just out and out say no. I, I, I remember the wine had a song that was called Tomorrow. T tomorrow. I, I, I'll give my life tomorrow. <laughs> but he goes on to say, choose the Lord today. But because but, but, tomorrow you may not make it there. <laughs> it very well might as well be today. Or not yet is no better than to know. And, and so as followers of Jesus, we should make his instructions paramount. We should make his instructions our priority in our life. The Bible tells us clearly to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all those other things will be added. Everything else will be taken care of when we seek him first and prioritize him. And we put some urgency on following his commands. Jesus tells that man, let the dead bury the dead. And you come with me now. Let the spiritually dead bury the spiritually dead. Let them mourn and whine and complain and moan about what happened. The fact of the matter is that it's going to happen whether you're there or whether you're gone. What the kingdom taking place right now is more urgent than anything else that may be going on in your life. In a few months, nobody would have been thinking about that funeral. In a few months, nobody would even be thinking about the, the time they spent in mourning. But giving someone the message of the kingdom would change someone's life eternally. Giving someone the message of the kingdom would affect their daily lives. It wouldn't just be for a few weeks or a few months. It would affect them every last day of their lives. And so it's clear that there was more urgency in spreading the gospel than it was sitting around with those people in their ceremonies. We're charged with having the same sense of urgency as followers of Christ today. We can't allow that to dictate our devotion. And what we see in the last man is something that he allowed to dictate his devotion and his discipleship were distractions. Distractions. And this is a big one for us as believers. The reason why we fast and pray and we remove social media and we remove secular television and, and we remove those things that we spend a lot of time with is because we want the opportunity to get rid of distractions. The final man who is given an invitation to follow Jesus makes this excuse. He says, again, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to my family. Another seemingly reasonable request. I'm going to follow you in a little bit. After I say bye to everybody, after I go dap up my kinfolk, after I go hug my mom and them, after I have one last dinner with everybody, I'm going to come follow you, Jesus. But first, let me just make sure everybody is good and let them know that I love them and I'm going to see them after a while. And, you know, I'm going to be back after. I'm going to go. Jesus done called me. You know, I'm, I'm going to go with him. And it seems like a fair request, but... He's making the same mistake in regards to urgency as the person did before him. And he's making an even bigger mistake when it comes to distractions. The people that would distract him by his past. Because you know sometimes when you go to say goodbye, it can open the doorway for you to change your mind about leaving altogether. You go to say goodbye and they get to crying and showing emotion and saying, oh, I'm going to miss you so much. Do you really have to go? away with Jesus? Can't you just be with him when he's in his ministry in town? Can't you just be by us and, and, and then whenever he's nearby you can be his disciple, but do you really got to go full, straight all the way out there, traveling around the country with no place to lay? You know he ain't got no place to lay his head. I, I, you know, there's, there's birds with nests and fox with dens, but he ain't got no place to lay his head. And you gonna go with him? You know how family would get sometimes trying to convince you not to do what you should be doing and you know you called to do. You know how family would get sometimes. And so he said, let me go talk to my family. Let me just go eat with them one time. Let me go say goodbye to them. But the problem was he was leaving the doorway open to not going at all by consulting his past. 
by consulting his family, by being distracted by those things. I, I, I have, to be honest with you, I, I have an issue with, with, with food sometimes when I'm trying to eat better. When I'm trying to do better in dieting and, 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 and watching my weight and with health, I have an issue sometimes. I tell myself this lie that I'm sure some of y'all tell yourself sometimes as well. Say, I'm going to eat better, but today, let me get one last meal in. Let me get one last double cheeseburger with extra sauce, pickles, lettuce, tomato, grill my onions, a big thing of onion rings to go along with it. Give me some spicy ketchup too. Give me a milkshake in place of a drink because I'm going to go all out because after today, after today, I'm going I'm, I'm to get it together. I make it home, unwrap my cheeseburger. I done already ate a couple of my onion rings in the car. I start devouring this meal that's in front of me and it started getting real good to me. I'm talking about the patties were so juicy. <laughs> they made it just right for me. They knew I was about to go on a diet and they knew how they could draw me right back in. And even though I was ready to stop eating this way, uh, tomorrow's a little soon. I'm only pushing out a week. And I still get fit. I'm going to still get right. I just want to eat a, another burger or two before I got to go a long time. It's going to be a long time I'm going to be dieting. So let me just get one more week. And we find ourselves in this perpetual habit of pushing tomorrow to next week. And next week becomes next month. And then sooner or later next week, next month becomes next year. And sooner or later we ain't did it at all. We never made the decision. We got distracted by what felt good and what was good at the time. And we got the memories of, of the things we did in our past, and, and we just wanted a little bit more of it before we started doing right. We just wanted a little bit more taste before we got healthy in our discipleship. We just wanted a little bit more, and eventually we moved completely away from the plans and purposes that we had to begin with. It's a slow but inevitable demise when we continue putting things off and get distracted by what's in front of us. Jesus knew he wasn't fully committed and, and, and he could be persuaded by his family to go. And so he tells him this. He says, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Anyone who says, I'm going to start on this mission and then instead of focusing on what's in front of them, they turn around and they're looking behind them and not paying attention to what's going on, things will get in disarray and they're not fit for what God is doing. Jesus is saying we need to be focused on moving forward and doing the work of the kingdom once you receive that call because if you're looking back, yes. you will get off track. If you're looking back, you won't be able to correctly steer the plow. The plow will be compromised in the direction that it's going. And maybe the reason that your life has looked as crooked as it has is because instead of focusing on the mission and the kingdom that's in front of you, you've been looking at the past and what's behind you and distracted by what used to be good to you before you were born again and what used to be good to you back in the day when you was with your friend and them. But when you look forward and you stir the plow in the right direction, you can accomplish what you're trying to do for the kingdom because you're focused on what's ahead and not what's behind. You keep getting on track because you're looking backwards. Instead of focusing on developing and, and getting your spiritual relationship closer to God, you're focused on what's behind. And as a disciple of Jesus, we have to be focused on him and move forward to what he's calling us to. I believe it was Paul that said in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, he says, I don't consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do is forgetting what lies behind me and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize 
of the upward calling in Christ Jesus. I'm not worried about the things that happened in the past. I'm not worried about what I went through before. If he's calling me to be his disciple, then he's qualified me to be his disciple. So even though people are looking at me strange now because I'm going out and doing the work of God, even though people are doubting my character and saying the things about what I used to be and who I used to be, I can be confident in the fact that he's calling me forward. He's qualified me to do his work and I'm pressing forward to the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what I'm doing. I'm not, I'm not worried about what's behind me anymore. I'm, not, I'm no longer being hindered by my distractions. I'm no longer not moving with a sense of urgency because now is the time. Now I have to do it. I'm no longer worried about being uncomfortable because I realize growth can take place in discomfort. And as I'm doing those things, I'm growing as a disciple of Christ Jesus. Today, I want to challenge you to look over your life and see, are there areas that are stopping me from accomplishing being the disciple of Christ Jesus that he's designed me to be and that he's called me to be? Is it hindering me? Is it stopping me because of something I'm distracted with? Because of something that may not necessarily be a sin, but something that I'm putting at a higher priority than my relationship with God? Are we truly seeking after him first? Or are we so consumed with ourselves that we're missing out on the proper opportunity to be discipled and grow in Christ Jesus? This week and next week, and for the remainder of this year, discipleship will be our focus. And we're no longer okay with just accepting the salvation. We want to grow as spiritually mature Christians in this body. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Let's pray together. <laughs> Lord God, our Father, we just thank you today for the salvation you've given us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we're so grateful that you saw fit to send your son to die on a rugged cross for us, to cover our sins, get rid of our shame. Lord, to build us up again. But we ask you today, Lord, that you would give us the mental strength, the spiritual fortitude, the confidence we need to grow deeper in you. That we wouldn't let any distractions get in the way of the direction that you're leading our lives. Lord, help us to remember to read our words. Help us to remember to go to you in worship. Help us remember to pray. And as we do that, Lord God, build us up, strengthen us up, strengthen us as a body, strengthen us individually. Lord, we want to be more like you. We thank you and we give you praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all the saints of God said, amen. 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 Well, we thank God for the word that has gone forth today. And I pray that you were encouraged and that you're looking forward to this year with the opportunity to grow in your faith. I thank God for those that have joined us online today, for those that may be watching this broadcast live or may be watching it even later. We thank God for you and thank you for joining us today. Um, we pray blessings over your life. We'd love to have you come visit us right here and have your face in the place. We're right here at 3710 Wellington Street in Greenville, Texas. We'd love to have you come by and stop. We'd love to hug you in person and just let you know that God loves you. Also, if you're interested in partnering with us in the ministry that we're doing right here in Hunt County, there'll be some information that comes up on the screen now. You'll see our cash app. We'd love for, to partner with you in doing the will of God in this city. And if you want to connect with us, um, we have a phone number that you can call. And if you, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a phone number that you can text. You can text that phone number and you'll get updates for all the latest events that are taking place right here at Rivers of Love. As always, God loves you, and so do we. Be blessed.